I only have one message to give you. I don't care what you think of me. I don't care what you call me. I do not care what you do with this information because it is important to our survival as a species. What you just heard is a warning. I'm William Cooper, and you're listening to the Hour of the Time. The Jack Boots will come if we are not careful. Tim says I'm in one of my moods tonight, so you better watch out. He's standing here with a baseball bat in case I get too much out of hand. He'll whack me upside the kisser. Yes, sir. From our station chief in Pennsylvania. The matter before the Pennsylvania State Legislature concerning the Conference of States has again been sent back to the Rules Committee and placed on indefinite hold. There appears to be too much opposition for a vote. Thanks to all of you who responded to the call of the Constitution Party in the hour of the time, which, uh, for all practical purposes, are the same thing, (laughs) at least when we're engaging in political matters. Uh, The rally, held on March 20th, appears to have been a successful skirmish by the ragtag band of ordinaries who faced the cannons of the regulars, and you won. Despite efforts by a one Marshall Peters, Marshall Peters, little scumbag socialist, uh, representative of uh, the liars in the country, Marshall Peters lives in Maryland. He attempted to sabotage the rally by sending out uh, faxes and uh, injecting fears of a violent confrontation. He just flat lied. And Marshall Peters is indicative of what's wrong with this country. He will be the first to cry and whimper and beg for someone to help him when he gets whatever it is that he wants. Certainly isn't liberty. He attempted to sabotage the rally via a fax network by injecting fears of a violent confrontation. And uh, some segments of the Pennsylvania Gun Owners Association, who initially urged their members not to attend for whatever reason. The rally was considered extremely successful. We stopped it, ladies and gentlemen. It's been put on hold for at least three more weeks. The attendance would have been much higher were it not for the unknown motifs of Marshall Peters and some of the Pennsylvania Gun Owners Association, why they would oppose a demonstration against a constitutional convention is beyond me. I would urge you, if you are a member of the Pennsylvania Gun Owners Association, to turn in your resignation, for they, too, seem to be against liberty and against free speech, as a matter of fact. I've never tried to prevent anyone from going to a rally or speaking their mind ever. And that's un American, in case, uh, in case you don't know it. But the rally was a tremendous success. There were an awful lot of people there, and we stopped it. We succeeded. And uh, I haven't got a report yet from California, but from what I understand, our efforts there are uh, taking on the appearance of being equally successful. Four people, folks, left Illinois at midnight to be at the rally in Pennsylvania on time. Mrs. Fish, wife of the late Congressman Hamilton Fish Sr., who opposed President Roosevelt all through their congressional careers into Roosevelt's presidency, came all the way from Port Jervis, New York, to attend. Kevin Wallace, a young black man, risked his job to attend and save his protection under the Constitution of his rights. 
Constitution Party member Chuck Howard spent several hours in the newsroom in Harrisburg to help sway KWI radio reporter Barbara Petito to give an accurate report of the events. Ms. Petito originally stated that Philadelphia welcomed the Conference of States, but without clarifying the stipulation that the conference be informal and without legal empowerment, and that the city council voted unanimously for rejection of participation. KWI Radio is the largest radio station in Philadelphia. WWDB Radio, with the largest talk radio audience in Philadelphia, began to report accurately, finally. The Constitution Party on both stations was given top billing as the organizing and coordinating effort behind the rally. It appears that there was a definite collateral effect of this skirmish that somehow seemed insignificant in itself. It was discovered, folks, by informed sources in the Capitol that the legislators were not even aware of the Philadelphia resolution calling for rejection of the participation resolution of the State House. The State Legislature will not be in session for the next three weeks, so we're confident that this matter will not be brought up at least until that time. And this will give us plenty of time to ensure that every member of the House will receive a copy of the Philadelphia City Council resolution. Apparently, someone kept that from them. So, everyone in Pennsylvania and the surrounding states and everyone who has attended these rallies shouldered their muskets and advanced toward the next skirmish. We will be working in the state senate on rescinding their resolution. And once the senators realize the broad-based opposition to the conference, we're convinced, ladies and gentlemen, that we can turn many of them around. When the House returns after three weeks, we'll be on the line again. I thank all of you who showed up and did, did your part. And, of course, all of you sat at home and whined about the status quo and did nothing. <laughs> you missed a good chance to feel good about yourselves. But since you are the perpetual feel bad about yourselves, and that's what probably keeps you from doing anything, you didn't. A quick note. This is from uh, Dick. A quick note to let you know that the fax number for Dave Kelly, Dave Kelly, is 916-323-4646. That's 916-323-4646. That's for Dave Kelly. The number that I gave out last night was apparently was missing. We didn't have a fax number for him. It's 916-323-4646. They didn't want to give it to me at first. They questioned why I wanted it and uh, wanted to know who I was. I told them I was a citizen of California and wanted to voice my, voice my opinion via fax. Johnson's office turned their fax off for a while. I asked why I couldn't send a fax. They said they were overwhelmed with comments. It came on about five minutes later. <laughs> Keep going, he says. Well, we certainly will. And thank you, Dick, for your efforts. Uh, late notice, meeting that we thought was too late to get uh, to me, to have announced on the hour of the time has been scheduled for tomorrow. Handgun Control Incorporated. Handgun Control Incorporated. This is for the citizens of Oklahoma. Handgun Control Incorporated. Advocate and spokesperson Sarah Brady, the big mama, is scheduled to speak tomorrow. That's the 22nd at the University of Oklahoma in Norman, Oklahoma. At the Oklahoma Memorial Ballroom beginning at 7 p.m. Central Time. That's the Handgun Control Incorporated Advocate and Spokesperson Sarah Brady is scheduled to speak tomorrow, the 22nd, at the University of Oklahoma in Norman, Oklahoma at the Oklahoma Memorial Ballroom beginning at 7 p.m. Central Standard Time. The event is sponsored by the Oklahoma University Speakers Bureau the OU chapter of the National Organization for Women and the Women's Student Asso Association. The Oklahoma Freedoms Network will stage a protest rally from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. on the North Oval, whatever that is, on the North Oval, which is located at the intersection of University and Boyd in Norman, Oklahoma. That's the intersection of University and Boyd in Norman, Oklahoma. Lawton, Oklahoma chapter chairman David Dixon said his group is expecting more than 1,000 protesters uh, Wednesday night. This is... What night is this, anyway? 
This is Tuesday. Well, I've been working so hard here, folks. I've lost a whole day. I thought it was Wednesday. But no, Wednesday is tomorrow night. Dixon said the network is hiring campus security, but said he expects no violence. We're going to have a good time, he said. We're going to try to keep things pretty humorous, but pretty serious. And that'll be a good trick if you can do it. Dixon, who said he will wear a Revolutionary War Continental Captain's uniform, said a large billboard will be displayed, which shows George Washington kicking Sarah Brady in the rump with the words, Kick the Brady Bill Out. All concerned citizens and friends of liberty are strongly encouraged to attend, and I strongly encourage you to attend. There are no phone numbers for further information. Um, part of the text of this fax is taken from the Oklahoma Daily of the 21st, which was today. So that's tomorrow night, between 6 and 7 p.m. Uh, at the North Oval, which is located at the intersection of University and Boyd in Norman, Oklahoma. And... Uh, Show up. Protest this woman who thinks that uh, you can keep your liberty if you don't have any strength. <laughs> and uh, we all know that that's wrong. Okay, Texans. All you Texans, listen up. These are the members of the State Affairs Committee of the 74th Legislature who are considering the participation resolution for the Conference of States as we speak. Curtis Seedlitz, Chairman. Uh, I'm going to give you their phone numbers. 512. They all start with 512, so I'm going to tell you that now, and I'm not going to say the area code again. 512. Curtis Seedlitz, Chairman. Uh, 463. 0474. That's 463 0474. Sylvester Turner, Vice Chairman. 463 0554. That's Sylvester Turner. 463 0554. Leo Albardo. Leo Albardo. 463 0616. And they're all 463, so from now on I'll just give you the last four. Leighton Black. Leighton Black. 0684, that's 0684. Fred Bose, B-O-S-S-E, 0660, that's Fred Bose, 0660. Bill G. Carter, 0482, that's Bill G. Carter, 0482. Tom Craddock, 0500, Tom Craddock, 0500. Deborah Danberg, 0504. That's Deborah Danberg. 0504. Paul Hilbert. 0572. That's Paul Hilbert. 0572. Scott Hotchberg. 0492. That's Scott Hotchberg. 0492. Bob Hunter. 0718. That's Bob Hunter. 0718. Delwyn Jones, 0542. That's Delwyn Jones, 0542. Brian McCall, 0592. That's Brian McCall, 05... I'm sorry, that's 0594. Brian McCall is 0594. I apologize, folks. 0594. Tom Ramsey. 0680, that's Tom Ramsey, 0680, and Steve Wollens, W-O-L-E-N-S, 0746, that's Steve Wollens, 0746. You can write to all of the above by just uh, writing representative and whatever the name is, box 2910, it's all the same, box 2910, but the representative and their name... Box 2910, Austin, Texas. Austin, Texas, 78768. That's 78768. And you might want to put state capital. Make sure that the male people don't get lost. Don't go away. Ladies and gentlemen, I'll be right back. In Senate Report 93-549 of 1973, we find these true but yet very startling words. Quote, Since March the 9th, 1933, the United States has been in a state of declared national emergency, war. 
For 40 years, freedoms and governmental procedures guaranteed by the Constitution have in varying degrees been abridged by laws brought into force by states of national emergency. This vast range of powers, taken together, confer enough authority to rule the country without reference to normal constitutional processes. Under the powers delegated by these statutes, the President may seize property, organize and control the means of production, seize commodities, assign military forces abroad, institute martial law, regulate the operation of private enterprise, and in a plethora of particular ways, control the lives of all American citizens. Enormous scope of powers. A literal time bomb that many of us believe is going to go off within the next few years, if not sooner, maybe months. The report goes on to read, and I quote, Furthermore, it would be a largely futile task unless we have the President's active collaboration, having delegated this authority to the President, in ways that permit him to determine how long it shall continue simply through the device of keeping declarations alive. We now find ourselves in a position where we cannot reclaim the power without the President's acquiescence. We are unable to terminate these declarations without the President's signature, so we need a large measure of presidential cooperation. If the President can create crimes by fiat, and without congressional approval, our system is not much different from that of the Communists, which allegedly threatens our existence." End quote. That is why the Constitution Party was formed, and that's why we must field a constitutionally committed president and vice presidential candidate, and we must win the 96th election. And you must join us. President Johnson's veto message of the Reconstruction Act that placed the nation under martial law rule for the first time in our nation's history is enlightening and reads in part as follows. Now, I'm not talking about President Lyndon Johnson. It says, quote, I have examined the bill to provide for more efficient government of the rebel states with the care and anxiety which its transcendent importance is calculated to awaken. I am unable to give my assent for reasons so grave that I hope a statement of them may have some influence on the minds of the patriotic and enlightened men with whom the decision must ultimately rest. The bill places all the people therein named under the absolute domination of military rules, and the preamble undertakes to give the reason upon which the measure is based and the ground upon which it is justified. It declares that there exists in those states no legal governments and no adequate protection for life, property, and assets, and asserts the necessity of enforcing peace and good order within their limits. This is not true, as a matter of fact. The excuse given for the bill in the preamble is admitted by the bill itself not to be real. The military rule which it establishes is plainly to be used not for any purpose of order or the prevention of crime, but solely as a means of coercing the people into the adoption of principles and measures to which it is known that they are opposed, and upon which they have an undeniable right to exercise their own judgment. I submit to Congress whether this measure is not in its whole character, scope, and object without precedent and without authority, in palpable conflict with the plainest provisions of the Constitution, and utterly destructive to those great principles of liberty and humanity for which our ancestors on both sides of the Atlantic have shed so much blood and expended so much treasure. The authority here amounts to absolute despotism. Such a power has not been wielded by any monarch in England for more than 500 years. It reduces the whole population, all persons of every color, sex, and condition, and every stranger to the most abject and degrading slavery. No master ever had a control so absolute over the slaves as this bill gives. This proposition is perfectly clear that no branch of the federal government, executive, legislative, or judicial, can have any just powers except those which it derives through and exercises under the organic laws of the Union. 
Outside of the Constitution, we have no legal authority more than private citizens, and within it, we have only so much as that instrument gives us. This broad principle limits all our functions and applies to all subjects. It protects not only the citizens of the states which are within the Union, but shields every human being who comes or is brought under our jurisdiction. We have no right to do in one place more than in another that which the Constitution says we shall not do at all. When an absolute sovereign reduces his rebellious subjects, he may deal with them according to his pleasure, because he had that power before. But when a limited monarch puts down an insurrection, he must still govern according to law. This is a bill by Congress in time of peace. There is not in any one of the states either war or insurrection. The laws of the states and of the federal governments are all in undisturbed and harmonious operation. Actual war, foreign invasion, domestic insurrection, none of the appear, and none of these in fact exists. It is not even recited that any sort of war or insurrection is threatened. We see that martial law comes in only when actual war closes the courts and deposes civil authority. But this bill in time of peace makes martial law operate as though we were in actual war and becomes the cause instead of the consequence of the abrogation of civil authority. This is sufficiently explicit. Peace exists in all the territory to which this bill applies. It asserts a power in Congress in time of peace to set aside laws of peace and to substitute the laws of war. The purpose and object of the bill, the general intent which pervades it from beginning to end, is to change the entire structure and character of the state's governments and to compel them by force to the adoption of organic laws and regulations which they are unwilling to accept if left to themselves. End quote. Now, despite President Johnson's veto message, the Reconstruction Act was passed and martial law fell upon the land. It remains in effect over the citizens of the sovereign states today through the continued use of executive orders under the pretense of national emergencies. Further proof that martial law remained in effect after the Civil War can be found in the Congressional Globe, now called the Congressional Record. The following are excerpts from the April 20 through 29, 1870 Congressional Globe concerning H.R. 1328, which established the Department of Justice to continue to carry out martial law nearly five years after the end of the Civil War. Quote, the following bureaus shall be established in this department. A Bureau of International Law, a Bureau of Revenue Law, a Bureau of Military and Naval Law, a Bureau of Postal Law, a Bureau of Land Management Law, end quote. The department is the Department of Justice. Congressman Lawrence said, and I quote, this bill, however, does transfer to the Law Department, or the Department of Justice, as it is now called, the cognizance of all subjects of martial law, and the cognizance of all subjects of military and naval law, except that portion of the administration of military justice which relates to military court-martial, their proceedings, and the supervision of records. If a question of martial law is to be determined by the law officers of government, it will now belong to the Attorney General or to this Department of Justice. It will not belong to the Judge Advocate General of the Army. He will not be called upon for any opinion relating to martial law or military law except as to that part, portion of the administration of military law which relates to military justice. In other words, the Judge Advocate General, instead of giving legal opinions to the Secretary of War relating to the status of the States of the Union, their right to call upon the government for military protection or military aid, and other grave constitutional questions will be limited. The Judge Advocate General will perform duties administrative in their character, and almost exclusively so. But I will state to the House why, in my judgment, no transfer of the Judge Advocate General or of his duties to the Department of Justice has been proposed in this bill. If this had been done, the bill would have encountered the opposition of some of the officers of the Bureau of Military Justice and their friends, 
and so great is the power of men in office, so difficult is it to abolish an office, that we were compelled in the consideration of this subject to leave officers in this bureau untouched in their official tenure in order that this bill might get through Congress. But so far as the solicitor and naval judge advocate general is concerned, he is transferred with all his supervisory power over naval court-martials and the records and proceedings of such courts, so that to that extent this bill accomplishes the great purpose which it has in view of bringing into one department the whole legal service of the government. It is misfortunate that there should be different constructions of the laws of the United States by different law officers of the United States. End quote. Ladies and gentlemen, these traitors knew they would have encountered opposition from the military, so they decided to leave the military officers untouched during their tenure and transfer them to supervisory positions over court-martials. This appeased the military leaders who didn't have the foggiest idea as to what was really going on. Had the traitors fleeced the military of all their powers during their tenure in office, they would have realized so nothing was happening at the hen house and would have possibly taken military action. Unfortunately for America, our military leaders slept right through the overflowing treason and the overthrowing of the Constitution. The traitors were now faced with a very serious problem, namely, what to do with the powers of the office of the Judge Advocate General when their tenure in office expired. And they solved this dilemma by adding the following amendments. Quote, Congressman Jenks, I move to amend Section 3 by inserting the word naval before the words Judge Advocate General. End quote. The amendment was agreed to, and later Congressman Finkelberg stated, quote, I would suggest the propriety of amending the third section of this bill by inserting after the words the naval solicitor and naval judge advocate general the words who shall hereafter be known as naval solicitor. Mr. Jenks, I have no objection to that amendment, end quote. This amendment was also agreed to, and the office of the Judge Advocate General became known as the Naval Solicitor. Thus, when the existing tenure was over, the new office would have a different set of rules and regulations, so that the bill accomplished the great purpose which it had in view of bringing into one department the whole legal service of the government, without the power of the office of the Judge Advocate General getting in their way. This was a necessary step to bring the president into the position of dictator over America. But they had one other problem facing them, namely direct access to the Treasury for the Department of Justice without interference. They accomplished this by the following three sections of the bill. And we will continue that right after this break. Ladies and gentlemen, the hour of the time is brought to you by Swiss America Trading. If you don't have real money, Swiss America Trading is who we recommend that you get it from, because that's what they deal in. Precious metal in all its various forms, bullion, coin, and uh, <laughs> all different kinds of plans enabling you to take advantage of this short time period to protect yourself and your assets so that they don't disappear. In case you haven't noticed, the dollar is still sinking. The price of foreign goods goes up. What is keeping the stock market up where it is? Very simple. As the dollar goes down, ladies and gentlemen, foreign investors can buy stock on our market at deflated prices. Now, I know that many of you don't understand what I'm talking about. You see, but the dollars that they hold in their hands now will buy much more stock than what they would have purchased a long time ago. Now, as this continues to happen, 
you're going to find that almost all the products in our stores are going up in price. That's because most of them come from foreign countries. And as our dollar lowers in value, their currency, in respect to the dollar, increases in value, which means that their products are worth more, which means you're going to have to work a lot harder and a lot longer to buy the things that you used to buy. And if you think you can find the same things made in America, <laughs> good luck. Good luck. You can find some things made in America, but most of what you're used to living with aren't made here anymore. And even some of them that have Made in America labels on them are not made here. They may be assembled here, but the parts are made overseas. The only way to maintain the value of what you have now is the same way people have been doing it since money was invented way back in the dim midst of time. That's with a commodity. A commodity that keeps its purchasing power no matter how much the dollar or the currency or the paper fluctuates. And that's gold or silver coin. So call 1-800-289-2646 and get yourself some. That's 1-800-289-2646 and do it right this moment. Now listen carefully, ladies and gentlemen. I quote, The eighth section provides that the Attorney General is hereby empowered to make all necessary rules and regulations for the government. End quote. Quote, the 11th section provides that all monies hereafter drawn out of the Treasury upon requisition of the Attorney General shall be dispersed by such one of the clerks herein provided for the Attorney General as he may designate, and so much of the first section of the Act making appropriations past March 3, 1859, as provides that money drawn out of the Treasury upon requisition of the Attorney General shall be dispersed by such dispersing officer as the Secretary of the Treasury is hereby repealed. The 15th section provides that the supervisory powers now exercised by the Secretary of the Interior over the accounts of the district attorneys, marshals, clerks, and other officers of the courts of the United States shall be exercised by the Attorney General, end quote. Now remember, earlier in the broadcast, and for those of you, ladies and gentlemen, who have received Veritas, you know about the Trading with the Enemy Act. Under the Trading with the Enemy Act, the district courts of the United States are hereby given jurisdiction to make and enter all such rules as to notice and otherwise, and all such orders and decrees, and to issue such process as may be necessary and proper in the premises to enforce the provisions of this Act. And now we find out that the district attorneys, marshals, clerks, and other officers of the courts are under the Department of Justice. Now, here's a little test. All of you write this down, and you pick what you think. Under what branch of government are the following departments? Executive, legislative, or judicial. Pick one of those three. A is executive, B is legislative, and C is judicial. So, under what branch of government is the Department of State? Executive, legislative, or judicial? The next one, under what branch of government is the Department of Treasury? Executive, legislative, or judicial? The next one, under what branch of government is the Department of Defense? Executive, legislative, or judicial? Under what, depart under what branch of government is the Department of Justice? Executive, legislative, or judicial? Under what br uh, branch of government is the Department of the Interior? Executive, legislative, or judicial? The Department of Agriculture. Executive, legislative, or judicial? The Department of Commerce. Executive, legislative, or judicial? The Department of Health, Education, and Welfare. Executive, legislative, and judicial? The Department of Housing and Urban Development. Executive, legislative, or judicial? The Department of Transportation. Executive, legislative, or judicial? The Department of Energy. Executive, legislative, or judicial? The Department of Education. 
executive, legislative, or judicial. The Department of Veteran Affairs, executive, legislative, or judicial. The answer, ladies and gentlemen, is found under Section 101 of Title V of the United States Code. All of the above departments are under the executive branch, which raises quite a few questions about the balance of powers between the executive, judicial, and legislative branches of government. Because, you see, there is no balance of power under a declared state of emergency. And we've been living under a declared state of emergency ever since the Civil War. From Veritas, we only went back to 1933 and tried to stick to the modern time so that it would seem more in line with what affects you today. Where, ladies and gentlemen, is the separation of powers if the Department of Justice is under the executive branch? Shouldn't it be part of the judiciary? The answer, of course, is yes, but it's not. If you don't believe me, look under Section 101 of Title V of the United States Code. If only Congress has the power to regulate commerce under Article I, Section 8 of the Constitution, why are the Department of Commerce and Department of Transportation under the executive branch and not under the legislative branch? And folks, if only the Congress has the power to make money according to the Constitution, why is the Department of Treasury under the executive branch? The Commerce Department, quote, part of the executive branch of federal government headed by a cabinet member, Secretary of Commerce, which is concerned with promoting domestic and international business and commerce, end quote. To further illustrate the takeover by the executive branch of government via martial law, the following are under the Department of Justice, ladies and gentlemen. And remember, the Department of Justice is under the executive branch. The Office of Solicitor General, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the Drug Enforcement Agency, the Bureau of Prisoners, Immigration and Naturalization, United States Marshal Service, Office of Justice Program, United States Parole Commission, United States National Central Bureau, Interpol, by the way, Interpol is a private corporation, yet it comes under, in this country, the judicial branch of government. The Office of the Pardon Attorney, Executive Office of the United States Attorney, Criminal Division, Civil Division, Antitrust Division, Civil Rights Division, whatever the hell that is, Tax Division, Environmental and Natural Resource Division, Community Relations Services, again, whatever that is, Foreign Claim Settlement Division, Executive Office of United States Trustees, Executive Office for Immigration Review, Justice Management Division, Office of Legal Counsel, Office of Policy Development, Office of Legislative Affairs, Office of Public Affairs, Office of Liaison Services, Office of Intelligence and Policy Review, Office of International Affairs, Office of the Inspector General, Office of Professional Responsibility. From American Jurisprudence, Second Reference, KF 154 at 42. So, ladies and gentlemen, now you know, while you're all running around like chickens with your head cut off, worried that they're going to declare martial law <laughs> and come after the militia, it don't bother me a bit, because I know we've been under martial law for so long ago that I couldn't possibly remember it in my lifetime, and neither could you. I don't care how old you are. You see, here we deal with facts. Out there you deal with emotions. Here we're trying to save a nation of 250 million people, and you're up in arms because four guys are laying on the courthouse floor in Montana. That ain't where it's at. That is not where it's at. See, you're all out there. You're all out there looking around in the darkness, and you know something's 
stinks to high heaven, you don't know what it is. Well, folks, if you'd quit bending over so far and pull your head out of that great orifice that you've got it in, you might smell a little fresh air, and you might be able to see a little more clearly. Now, I have put myself in the role of waking up the sheeple. And unfortunately, it means that I've got to do some things and say some things that makes me, in the long run, the bad guy. And I know a lot of you don't like it and you don't like me for that very reason. But I'm going to continue to do it simply because there's nobody else out there who will do it. And it must be done. We can't regain our freedom. We can't restore the republic. We can't put the Constitution back in its rightful, legal and lawful place as the supreme law of the land. If we're running around bumping into trees, bumping into each other, scared of every little shadow, passing rumors back and forth, jumping up and down every time you hear some little tale from somebody, we have to pay attention to the real enemy, to the real task that lies before us. We cannot, under any circumstances, be goaded into any kind of stupidity, our stupid confrontation, our answering some alert sent out by somebody in some place somewhere because some of their people got themselves in trouble. When my family and I were guests down in Phoenix, I didn't call up the militia. I called for some militia members to come down and witness what was happening so that I could survive the court battle. I didn't send out a mission, militia alerts across the country, nor did anyone else in my behalf. And I handled my own legal problem myself, in my own way, with my own money. I did not beg you for legal defense funds. I kept my eye on the sparrow, ladies and gentlemen. And that's exactly where you'd better put yours. A militia, by definition, is to protect the nation and the state. If you are a state militia, your first obligation is to your state constitution and to your state. To your communities, to your counties. The militia of Michigan has no obligation to the militia of Arizona unless the nation finds itself in war to fight a battle to protect the Constitution and the Bill of Rights of the United States of America. You all need to understand these things because you don't seem to understand much at all. Until that happens... You have no obligation anywhere but in your local community, in your state, to your state constitution. If and when another Waco occurs, or someone attempts another Waco, then we must all come together to stop it. But until then, we don't march because Joe Blow, having nothing to do with the militia whatsoever, goes with some friends and gets himself arrested for whatever reason. You don't do that. And you don't run around with, like chickens with your head cut off because there's a rumor that somebody's going to come after you this weekend. You don't do that. The militia, by definition, must be ready to respond at any time to any emergency. You don't go home and watch television and wait for the next rumor and then run around scared that something's going to happen. You must be prepared all the time, every moment, every day, every week, every month, every year if you are a member of the militia 
to respond if you are called upon. You must always protect your leadership. If all of you out there really believe that something's going to happen this weekend, there's a very easy way to make sure that nothing does happen. It's very simple. Go somewhere else. When they come for you where they think you're going to be, just don't be there. And you don't discuss your weaknesses and your fears or your strengths on radio. Every time someone attempts that on this broadcast, you see me cut them off. And so you flock to all the other radio stations so that you can talk about how scared you are and how weak your militia is or how strong your militia is or what your plans are. And you are stupid. Stupid. Keep it up. You will ensure that if there ever is a confrontation, you will be defeated soundly very quickly. Not because the enemy is strong. Not because the enemy is smart. Not because the enemy is any better. But simply because you're stupid and you're acting stupid. Recently, in the militia of Michigan, one of the best, strongest militias in this country, There was a meeting where some contingency plans were discussed, and whether or not what was said was planned was planned, I have no idea. But a militia officer went out and began talking about it. He should have gone to his commanding officers, and there should have been a hearing called an investigation by the command staff, and it should have been dealt with quietly within the command staff and not on radio all over the nation as it was. Everyone concerned should be busted from their rank and new leadership should be installed. If the militia is going to be successful, the militia had better learn discipline. You had better learn that you do not ever make a public statement on behalf of the militia or about the militia without the consent and permission of the highest commanding officer in the militia. No public statements should ever be made except by a public relations officer who specializes in public relations and communicates every release and gets permission for every release from the commanding officer of the militia. You people are headed for a fall, most of you. I keep getting calls. Can I be a member of the Cotton of the Second Continental Army of the Republic. No, you cannot. Membership is by invitation only, except in the Intelligence Corps, which I am the director of, and I determine who can be a member and who cannot be, and under what terms, and what job they do. You don't hear all this stuff from the Second Continental Army of the Republic. You don't hear rumors about the Second Continental Army of the Republic. You don't hear people on the radio speaking for the Second Continental Army of the Republic. You don't hear leaks from the Second Continental Army of the Republic. And you never will. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I suggest that those of you who are not guilty of any of this, get with those who are and teach them how to grow up. Teach them to take off their diapers and put on a pair of pants. Teach them to function as adults and not children. We're not playing cowboys and Indians here. And sooner or later, all this stupidity is going to cause people to lose their lives. Whoever fires the first shot loses the war. And there are many people out there trying to instigate you into doing exactly that. When the militia of Montana called for all of the militias of all of the states to march to New Mexico because Catron County was overrun with the National Guard and the FBI and the BATF and the citizens were being rounded up and put in a concentration camp, if you had done it, 
it would have been all over. And every patriot in this country would now be in jail. You better understand it. You better start thinking straight. It is imperative for the future of not only your state but the nation, for the future of liberty, that you learn to be responsible. When I went to speak in Michigan, here it was a Constitution Party rally, and all these guys kept showing up in camouflage fatigues even to the little garrison cap and field jackets and jack boots. It wasn't a militia meeting. These guys were playing games. They were feeding their egos. It made them feel good. Those are the wrong people to have in the militia. You see, if dressing up like a soldier makes you feel really big, and if it puffs up your ego, you shouldn't be there. If carrying a gun makes you feel bigger or more important, then you should never be allowed to carry a gun, in my estimation. But since I believe in the second article and amendment, I would be the last to stop you. But I happen to know something about human nature. A lot of you are playing games out there. You're feeding your egos. You're substituting for your sexual inadequacies and your lack of personality or character or whatever it is. You're trying to make up for your sense of insecurity. And that's not going to get it. We need strong, self-reliant, confident men and women in the militias. Men and women who will answer the call when it is necessary. Who will train and be prepared and be ready. Who will keep their mouths shut. Militias who will not get on the radio and talk about their inner squabbles or whatever is happening. And you must hold your people accountable. And if they will not act responsible, and if they will not maintain discipline, you must bust them in rank as a warning. If that doesn't work, you must oust them from your military unit. And it's not called paramilitary. Get rid of that word. The militia is military. You must oust them. Militia members should never wear any kind of a uniform unless they are participating in a training activity which requires it. If you're going to be on television and meet the press, you should wear a suit and tie. You should know the law. You should know the history of the militia. You should talk about those things and not how many Soviet tanks are in the United States, which makes you look like a blooming idiot, even though we know there are. And if you're the leader of a militia, don't take somebody else to speak for you. If you can't speak, don't go. If you can't speak, you got no business leading. And cut out all this religious crap. The militia is a military organization, not a church. Good night, my children, and God bless you all.